following message is presented by Community Gospel Church in Bremen, Indiana. It is our great privilege to share this ministry with you. We in no way intend for this to be a replacement for the local church. It is our prayer that this would serve as a resource to help make Jesus Christ known in our congregation and other congregations gathering across the world. For more information about Community Gospel Church, visit www.communitygospelchurch.com. Well, it's good for several reasons to have Jordan as my friend, but one is I get to come and speak here quite often when he's gone, and uh, it's nice I live about five minutes from here as well. Uh, next week, I begin a church up in uh, Gall Lake, Michigan. It's, uh, I checked, it's 94 miles to drive on Sunday morning, so this is uh, a lot easier. I threw this picture up here that I really like. Uh, that's a depiction of the Apostle Paul and Titus, or, uh, Timothy. And uh, we're studying the book of Titus. But uh, you notice that I love this picture because Peter, the, or rather uh, Paul, the old man there, he's uh, got his finger pointed out, his hand over his heart, he's uh, leaning into the wind. He's aggressive, always on a big adventure for Jesus. And there's Timothy with him. And uh, praying all the way. Because when you got involved with the Apostle Paul, you got yourself in danger. He said you need to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He told uh, Timothy in 1 Timothy, you stay in Ephesus and deal with those false teachers. He wanted to leave. It was a tough place. And I know Jordan has already shared with you that Crete, uh, an island in the Mediterranean, 160 miles long and 37 miles wide at its widest point, uh, was a, a very, very evil place. And we'll see this in the text we're going to study here. And he assigned Titus to that particular place. Now, nowhere in Scripture do you see where he's encouraging Titus to, uh, to not be timid. I don't think uh, Titus struggled with that. He was a Greek, and I think Titus was the man for the job on Crete. He, his assignment was to establish churches all around that island and then to make certain that it was led by leaders that, quote, are above reproach. Man, when you study the word above reproach in the Greek, it scares you to death. Is anybody qualified? It, it was used of being polished, smooth, no handles, something without any handles, there's nothing to grab hold of these people and say, hey, you shouldn't be in leadership. They must have godly character. We're going to look at three must-haves in uh, leadership in the church. Anybody that leads in the church, by the way, uh, in James it says, stop being teachers. Don't you know you're going to receive the greater judgment, higher expectations, and greater judgment if you fail? Because you do so much good or so much damage when you're in a leadership position. So, you must have godly character. We're going to look at the fact that says you must also have a firm grip on the scriptures. You must be convinced that it's true. You must have conviction about it. And number three, you better have guts. Because you're going to have to take on liars false teachers that infilt the church and are going to upset the church. You're not to be a hireling that runs away when the wolf comes. The sheep stays to protect, or the, the true shepherd stays and fights for the sheep. He feeds the sheep and he fights off the wolf. So there's three uh, must-haves of church leadership. And I tell you what, if I had known this before I went into it, Many years ago, I think I'd run the other way. It's like, who, who's up to such a task? It doesn't mean perfection, but it does mean pursuit. Because we've all known cases where someone in leadership has led others astray. And where would Satan want that to happen more so than in this church? Every church. We are in a battle, you know. Your own pastor put on, I saw on Facebook this week, a little statement, something about... Um, uh, it's that life is more a battlefield than it is a bed of flowers or a bed of roses. And that's true. And I don't think we think too much that way. 
We are all aware right now this uh, big war is going on over in Ukraine, and I don't pretend to know everything about uh, President Zelensky, but I did study him up a little bit. And that little guy was, did you know, a comedian and an actor? And then he began acting the role of a president of Ukraine. The next thing you know, he is the president of Ukraine. But it's not funny. It's not a comedy. Been invaded by the Russians. I love what he said. I love this man for this. When things got hot and started, the United States offered him evacuation for he and his family. And he said, fights here. I don't need ammo, or I don't need a ride. I need ammo. <laughs> the fight is here. I don't need to be evacuated. I don't need a ride out of here. I need ammo for the fight. I need power for the fight. I like that guy for that. He's not a hireling who's going to run away. He's the good shepherd who said, I expect to die. But the fight is here in the now. Well, I think Paul expected that of himself, but he also expected it of all his followers, particularly his leaders. Go into the fight and fight the good fight, as he says, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Have godly character, have a grip, be convinced, have conviction, and have guts. It's going to take courage. So, as we open up this text now, if you would please turn to Titus, uh, there's only 46 verses in the whole book, and I'm going to be covering verses 9 through 16 of chapter 1. We'll have it up on the screen, but uh, if you go ahead to the first verse um, of Titus chapter 1, verse 9, but you also have your scriptures there, here's one of those must. Earlier he says, they must be above reproach, and then he says... He, that is anyone in leadership in the church, must, it's not an option, hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. I love the fact that it says it's trustworthy. It's worthy of trust. You can trust the word of God. It's true. As taught, meaning don't try to get creative with it. <laughs> You know, actually, I think there's a kind of a temptation uh, by this time I've gotten over it with, and that's, that's that in ministry you think you have to be creative and come up with something nobody else has ever come up with before. God, God's not into creativity. He's into faithfulness to his word that's trustworthy. We're not going to come up with anything new for a new culture. And uh, you also, when you're young, you think you have to be cool. Well, I know I'm not cool anymore. You know, somebody said to me, Pastor, you, you never change. I said, oh, yeah, you wouldn't want to see me with my shirt off. <laughs> I shave with a T-shirt on now. I just don't want to see it. <laughs> you don't have to be cool. I don't know if Titus was cool or not. I don't know that Titus had to be creative in any way. What he did need to do was stay convinced and convicted to the Word of God as taught and have a firm hold on it. I like what the message, how it translates this here. He says, this is Eugene Peterson. The leader must have a good grip on himself and a good grip on the message. <laughs> so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. The word sound is a, a really good word. It means healthy, um, life-producing, wholesome. I mean, it's, it's that 12-grain bread rather than white bread <laughs> type of stuff. It's, you'll live off of it. It's life-giving. It's not junk food. Sound doctrine. Be able to tell people what the truth is, what will make them healthy. You know, it's interesting, and I've got it in your notes there. Um, the word sound in this little book of 46 verses says... There needs to be sound doctrine. There needs to be sound faith. That would be taking that doctrine and living it out because you trust it. Sound in love. Sound in endurance. 
and sound in speech that cannot be condemned. That's just a dominant theme all throughout. We need to be people who are sound in what we believe, sound in how we act, in how we act with others, loving, and sound in endurance, just holding on to the truth, even if it gets tough, and sound in what we say. We're not led astray. And then it says this. That's all about having a good grip on Scripture. Must be able to rebuke those who contradict it. And rebuke there is a strong word. It, it, it means to tell them they're wrong. <laughs> and uh, tell them that it, it uh, is destructive if in the church they're teaching unhealthy doctrine. Just junk food that won't feed people. A leader must have guts. You've got to have courage. And I don't think that one is said much. Uh, we talk about godly character. We, uh, we want somebody that uh, has godly character and somebody has a good gri- grasp of Scripture, but then we want somebody that's real nice. <laughs> Nobody would ever rebuke you, tell you you're wrong. Just say, well, that's an interesting thought. <laughs> no. Again, I like what uh, Eugene Peterson in the message says here. Listen to this, this uh, paraphrase of this. He must know how to use the truth to either spur people on in knowledge or stop, in them, stop them in their tracks if they oppose it. <laughs> stop them in their tracks if they oppose the truth. Because they need to hear the truth. And sometimes we don't like to hear the truth. You know, I have a friend that right now um, is having health issues. And periodically I've taken him to a therapist to actually teach him how to walk again. Uh, had a brain hemorrhage. And... Uh, his physical therapist is a, a, a big, huge, uh, I guess, previous uh, 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 star discus thrower in Poland that came to the States, and he's a physical therapist now, big guy. And uh, so I took him there, and uh, this guy's pretty firm. And this gentleman told me, he said to him, he says, when I'm walking or something, he'll say, foot up, Mark. Concentrate, Mark. Uh, and he said he's kind of just firm with it. And every once in a while, he'll say, good job, Mark. And he said, I told this gentleman, you know, Eric, I, I respond better to positive reinforcement than negative. <laughs> and he said, I give you the exact reinforcement you need. <laughs> I love that. And I, I told him when he told me that, I said, there's a sermon illustration in that. As a matter of fact, he's listening in today to this. Because don't you think that Jesus and Jesus is those who speak on his behalf should say, I'm giving you the exact reinforcement you need. What about parents, <laughs> mothers? You know, don't your kids say, you know, I respond better to positive reinforcement. <laughs> I'm giving you the exact reinforcement that you need. And that's the way God wants to deal with us. It's all in love. And then it says this, it's a warning. For there are many, and this isn't just Crete. There are many that infiltrate the church who are insubordinate. You don't tell them what to do. They don't put themselves under the authority of the word of God. Empty talkers, airheads. You know, I'll never forget, I had a lady uh, in my early days at Trinity uh, who would come, and I back then in those days, the pastor stood at the back of the door and greeted people, and she always avoided me and went around. Well, then one day, I grabbed her, and she ended up staying and uh, joined the church, and when she did, she said, listen, the church that I went to, she said, uh, the guy, the, the pastor, I never understood what he was saying. But it sounded brilliant. Therefore, I thought that's truly a message from God because I don't understand it. She said, I understood you. And therefore, I thought you weren't telling me a message from God because I understood it. And uh, thankfully, she learned that that wasn't true. Just empty air. (laughs) You know, it sounds good. When you, you get done, you go out and you think, huh, what? Nothing sound, nothing healthy, nothing that you can live off. They're deceivers, and they are deceived. 
especially, and this shocks me when I think of it. What do you expect now? Yeah, especially those heathen. No, especially those of the circumcision party. What does that mean? Especially the religious people. Those steeped in traditions and legalism. Rules and regulations rather than a relationship. What he's saying is, be especially aware that there are people that are going to come into church and try to put a bunch of rules and regulations on you that doesn't really control your old nature. And that instead of a relationship with Jesus Christ that can, they're legalist, the legalist party. Um, they're elder brothers rather than the younger brothers using the prodigals. He says... Uh, in a moment, these people need to be silenced. Remember uh, Archie Bunk? Silence it. <laughs> what, Edith? <laughs> That's what he's saying. They need to be muzzled, he's saying. Because all they do is just roar. You know, I heard about a, uh, a lion that killed a bull. And uh, oh, he was just eating that bull, ate till he couldn't eat anymore. Just rolled over in satisfaction, was roaring. A hunter hurt him, came, shot him, killed him. You want the moral of the story is? If you're full of bull, keep your mouth shut. (laughs) You know, I I, uh, shared that one with a friend of mine, Rick Hawks. Kim knows Rick. I said, you think I ought to tell that? And he goes, tell it. (laughs) And now you'll all tell it too, right? (laughs) It is a good one. That was by Will Rogers, if you know Will Rogers. Look at verse 11. They must, this isn't an option. You got to protect the sheep. They must be silenced. And these are those that would infiltrate the church with legalism, (laughs) as other things we're going to see. Silence them, muzzle them, since they're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what They ought not to teach. We go back and we look through this. Again, it's not optional. uh, They're not allowed to speak in the church. They're not allowed to teach. Why? And it's the word upsetting, subverting. uh, uh, It actually means to underturn. It was used of turning a boat. If somebody flipped somebody's boat and they drowned, that someone came and they upset it. They were rocking the boat. He said, these people are coming. And remember, these churches were meeting in homes, mainly families and extended families. And they, they come in and they turn the house upside down, the church upside down. And people are drowning. They're destroying people. They're killing people with their teaching. And why do they do it? For shameful gain in what they ought not to teach. And I got to thinking about gain, shameful gain. The first thing we think of is what? They're doing this for the money. I always follow the money. And that's true, the finances. But I think we see this even more so perhaps in uh, fame, a following. I want to be somebody. I want the applause. I want the acclaim. I want to be known as a great teacher, whatever, who's come up with some new knowledge, a new insight that no one else has ever had before me. And gain a following, maybe some finances in it. But uh, what he's saying is this has got to be stopped. And listen, it's actually destroying people's lives. And that's really upsetting to the Apostle Paul. He says, Titus, you got to deal with this. You're in a battle. That same physical therapist I was telling you about, the gentleman that I took there, uh, told him that uh, he wanted to know who I was. And back in the room, he said, he's my previous pastor. And remember, he's Polish, and most Polish are what? Polish Catholic. You can almost put the two words together. Big guy, and he comes out there, and uh, he knows I'm Mark's pastor. And he says... um, Or I said to him, I said, I understand you're from Poland. I said, I really admire the Poles for what they're doing right now with opening their borders to the Ukrainians. 
And I said, of course, you've been through it yourself. And he was raised in Poland. And this big guy, he looks down at me, and he says, someone should shoot that Putin. And then he goes, being Catholic, he goes, oh, you, uh, uh sorry. <laughs> and I, I don't think he ever met, he thinks of you as a priest, you know. I don't think he ever met a priest like this. I looked up at him, and I said, yeah, well, before I was Reverend Clapper, I was Corporal Clapper, United States Marine Corps. I'd shoot him myself. <laughs> Next time I came in, he's smiling. He, he, likes, he likes that kind of priest. <laughs> but it, I could tell he was a little bit shocked by it, you know. You know, the Bible says, abhor that which is evil and cling to the good. If you don't abhor evil, if you don't protect your family, if you don't protect the church, if you're a shepherd that would flee or just wants the wolf to like you, <laughs> then you're not doing your job. He says, this has to stop now, and you've got to deal with it, he tells him. Verse 12, one of the Cretans, who scholars almost all say, say was a 6th century B.C. philosopher in uh, uh, Crete, Epimenides, uh, said, once said, Cretans, people from Crete, are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And then he said, this testimony is true. Well, that's not nice to say, but I think he said it with humor because this. This was, this was their great prophet. And the great prophet they knew said, hey, everybody on Crete's a lie all the time they're evil beasts slow gluttons and you can't afford to say well that's not true oh your leading philosopher lied huh <laughs> puts them in a catch-22 but what paul is saying is uh it's a really really rough place it'd be like us saying you know the french quarter down in new orleans that is one rotten place now it's not saying every person down there is but it's saying it's known for that Man, uh, the Tenderloin District out in uh, San Francisco, stay away from there. It's an evil place. Well, are there any good people there? Yes. As a matter of fact, this church was made up of Cretans. And to be a Crete was actually a name yet today to, to lie. Now, Jordan told me that he was speaking to Freya. And Freya, your, your father's a Cretan? You probably can't trust the word he says. <laughs> He's a pastor too, missionary. But Jordan said that he said it's still that way. Yeah. You know, it was a very blessed island. Uh, crops just grew, lots of fish, lots of trade. You didn't have to work real hard to get by. Blessed by God, but instead of that, they were party animals. You couldn't trust them when you traded with them. It was known. Evil beast, interesting Crete has no wild beast. And what they said is the humans there made up for it. <laughs> and lazy gluttons, meaning they just, they're party animals, we might say today. And then the church was made up of those people. That was their previous lives. And they had people who were coming in either being real legalistic or real libertine and saying that's okay, you can live that lifestyle. And Paul says, you got to rebuke them sharply. And again, this is strong language. Believe me, I've had to do this in my career. And uh, some people think you should have done that. And some others say, that's not very nice. <laughs> Why? Why do you do it though? So that they may be sound in the faith. It's for their welfare. You're not doing it to just be mean. You're saying, listen, this is for your own welfare too. Um, you're going to have to... Give an account for your life. Tell them not to devote themselves to Jewish myths, the commands of people who turn away from the truth. Now we're getting into mythology. They had all kinds of stuff going on. They had all kinds of false teaching. There were the legalists. There were those that were libertines. And, um, but what they were doing, they were turning away from the truth. <laughs> um, you know, I'm certain that this is a libertine. Uh, we've all heard of the baker's dozen. You get home, you got 13. That's nice. Well, what if you got home, you had 11? You went back to the baker. He says, well, 
To me, 11's a dozen. <laughs> a baker's dozen for me is 11. And who are you to say 11's not a dozen or 13's a dozen? If you can make it 13, you can make 11. That would be the, the legalist just say, ah, it's only 11. <laughs> the libertines say, I'll throw another in there. You can, you can still live as a Cretan, lie once in a while, party like an animal and everything. That's, that's okay. Paul tells Titus, Titus, you got to teach truth. And you need men. You need leadership there that will come in and in leadership say, listen, um, you got to have godly character. You don't have to be perfect. Nobody's a greased pig, you know, polished to that extent. Um, and, but you, you also know to have, have to teach the word of God, have a good grasp on it, and you have to have guts to deal with error. And then he says this, verse 15, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and the unbelieving, nothing's pure. Their minds and their consciences are defiled. Now, this isn't the easiest little phrase to interpret. To the pure, all things are pure. I, th I think that it means this. If a person has a pure heart, they're cleansed by Jesus Christ, then the legalist shouldn't tell them that everything is wrong. Um, you know, there's some people, somebody said that a... Uh, the legalist is a person just worried sick that somebody out there is having a good time. <laughs> but that balance is hard to find at some point. There is truth. And to the pure, all things are pure, meaning this. Um, you could have a view of sexuality where everything's, everything's wrong. Just everything's wrong, you know. And... Um, and then you have a healthy view. But you can have such a warped view that every, every woman is a temptation for some people. They, they don't, they're defiled. They're unbelieving. Nothing's pure to them. If their mind is impure, then every woman can be uh, just a conquest to some people. So, again, the Spirit of God needs you to lead, the, lead you in this. You know, the... Um, uh, Book of Isaiah says something that I think really hits our times. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Man, don't we live in a time where they say, no, darkness is light and light is darkness. That's sweet. No, it isn't. It's bitter. No, no. And it doesn't even make sense. You know, um, I just read where John MacArthur said that he believes that at no time in history were we exposed to more lies and liars than we are today because of the Internet. <laughs> Nothing. And then, you know, and then our government's going to have the ministry of truth to tell you what the truth is. You think that'll be a, a correct dozen? <laughs> Could, their baker's dozen could be uh, uh, 144, you know, or zero, whatever. Uh, but let me ask you this. Where do you get your truth from? Here's a good question. What was uh, the last book you read? What was the last podcast you listened to? What was the last Netflix series you watched? Would it line up with truth? Are you getting a good hold on the truth? I love the, the word in Scripture. Uh, Paul says, I'm convinced of this. It was used out of carpentry. And I think we use the word, you carpenters would know, use the word clinch. Um, you beat the nail down, turn the board over, and you crimp it on the other side. And now it's convinced. <laughs> it ain't coming out. That's what Paul said. I expect... Those that are teaching in the church, leading people to have the word of God driven through them, turned on the other side, beaten in, and they're, it's not coming out. They're convinced that it's truth. Verse 16, summing up what I'm teaching today in this passage. They profess to know God. They, they, uh, they're good talkers. Seem religious. But they deny him by their works. <laughs> you want that saying? Look at their fruit. What comes out of their teaching? 
What fruit is born in their own lives? Give it time and see what happens. And therefore, I've got written in my notes here to myself, does my profession de de uh, declare that, I'm, that I know God or does it deny that I know God? Your overall life, does it declare that you're a child of God or would it deny it? And then it says this, they are, and look at how strong this language is. It must be extremely important. They are detestable. It means they can't be put to the test. They'll fail. They are disobedient. They don't obey. They are unfit. They're not fit. For any good work. They can't be used. God says, I can't use you. And I got to thinking about this. We've all had dull knives that are unusable until we file them. Mower blades this time of year. Hope you are uh, sharpening your mower blades or you're not going to cut well. But um, I use a chainsaw some, and uh, boy, that's one. Have you ever put the chain on backwards on the bar? If you have, you know, that baby just doesn't cut. As soon as you start, you oh, got it on backwards, you know, so you put it back. Well, some people are put on backwards, and God can't use them. They don't know Jesus Christ. They need to accept Jesus and get put right. But then, I'm very guilty of this, and you are too, if you've used a chainsaw much. The worst thing you can do if you saw through a log is to keep going and get that chain in the what? In the dirt. It only takes a few seconds, and now you're going to have to sharpen that thing. It is dull. And that's the one I was thinking about for myself. I need to stay out of the dirt. <laughs> I'm put on right. I'm going the right way on the bar. But sometimes I get down in the dirt, and I, I don't want to fail the test. I want to be fit for the master's use. So here's the, the big question for all of us, because we all teach somewhere. I'm writing a gospel, a chapter a day, by everything I do, everything I say. Others read me, so do you. Hey, what kind of a gospel are you? <laughs> um, are you godly? Are you pursuing godliness? No handles. Um, do you have a firm grip on Scripture? you really believe that the Scriptures are the truth? And that's the truth you're going to live by. And then, um, have you got guts to stand up and tell the truth? Stand up for truth in a world of lies. <laughs> and it isn't going to get any better. But we'll stand out as people of truth who can be used and fit for the Master's use. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for your Spirit that takes the Word of God and speaks to our hearts and minds about our lives. And Father, I know that uh, sometimes I want to run away from even being your spokesperson because I think, uh, who am I to speak? Um, I'm not a greased pig. I'm not totally polished. Father, you use us. At the same time, you want us to be in pursuit of godliness. And I pray that that would be true of our lives that we would make much of the Word of God, that we would read it, we'd uh, uh, ruminate upon it, remember it, and then uh, put it into practice. And we would have, even this week perhaps, will be a time at work or wherever where we're confronted by lies, and, uh, and we just say, you know, that's not true. Uh, could I tell you what is true? And we'd have guts to do so. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. And all God's people said... Amen. Thanks for letting me be with you again. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Community Gospel Church podcast. If you would like to support this ministry financially, simply log on to communitygospelchurch.com and click the Contribute tab.